Ah, oh, I'm a little rusty. It's been a few years. Good evening, I'm Samuel Ryder. And I bet you didn't expect to see me here tonight, did you? Well, I'm a bit surprised to see you as well. I'm proud to say that the Ryder Cup has become golf's premier competition, the Olympics of our game. What started as a small goodwill match is now among the greatest rivalries in our sport. And I must confess that no one is more surprised by this remarkable turn of events than me. If you'll allow an old man a brief remembrance of things past, I'll explain. I was born in England 150 years ago on the 24th of March, 1858. I worked in my father's nursery business, but made my fortune as an entrepreneur. My big idea was to sell packets of the most popular seeds for as little as a penny apiece. In 1907, my pastor invited me to play my first game of golf. I was 49 years old, but I was like a child in a candy emporium. I loved it. So I hired a local professional to teach me the game. And six days a week, rain or shine, he came to work with me. In my day, the golf professional did not enjoy the status he enjoys today. Wages were meager, the hours long and hard. Fortunately, I was blessed with the means to do something about it. In 1925, I hired the best player in England, Abe Mitchell, as my private professional. I paid him a thousand pounds a year. The goal was for Abe to win the Open Championship. Unfortunately, Abe never hoisted the claret jug. But what matters in life is the journey, not the destination. Now, you may wonder why they call this great event the Ryder Cup. Well, it's simple, really. I donated the trophy. And in case you're wondering, that's my good friend Abe Mitchell on top of the cup. The first official Ryder Cup was held in 1927 at Worcester Country Club in Massachusetts. An appeal to raise £3,000 to finance the British campaign fell a bit short, so I had to reach into my pocket for the last £500. Even though the Americans, led by the legendary Walter Hagen, defeated our boys 9.5 to 2.5, it was money well spent. Two years later, the British team rallied for a 7-5 victory at the Moortown Golf Club in Leeds. I had the honour of presenting the cup to our captain, George Duncan, who pummeled Hagen in singles by a margin of 10-8. and eight. With one victory apiece, a rivalry was launched, but it would have to weather many a storm. In 1939, the winds of war howled across Europe. The secretary of the British PGA dispatched a telegraph to their US colleagues saying, I quote, When we have settled our differences and peace reigns, we will see that our team comes across to remove the Ryder Cup from your safekeeping. World War II lasted for six dreadful years. With the Allied victory in 1945, there was a universal yearning for a return to normalcy. But golf in the United Kingdom had been decimated. Fortunately for our great game, a fruit merchant from Portland, Oregon, Robert Hudson, was determined to see that the Ryder Cup returned to its rightful place on the sporting calendar. He picked up the tab for our boys to compete. On November the 1st, 1947, the Ryder Cup was staged at the Portland Golf Club. Not surprisingly, those Yanks beat us again. But it wasn't the score that was important. It was the fact that the Ryder Cup had been saved. That passed for a fist pump in my day. Over the next 30 years, the best golfers in the game took the stage in the Ryder Cup. Players like Hogan, Sneed, Palmer, Nicholas, Alice, Reese, 
Jacqueline and Gallagher. Players relished the competition, but the results were quite one-sided. From 1927 to 1977, the US won 18, lost 3, and tied 1. With the outcome seldom in doubt, the golfing public began to lose interest. Desperate times called for desperate measures, and it was none other than Jack Nicklaus who found the solution. Nicholas suggested to Lord Derby that the British and Ireland side should be expanded to include players from continental Europe. It was a radical notion, but it would pay big dividends that few could foresee. Yeah, there it was. Let history show that that was it. 1979 saw the Europeans join the fray for the first time. The US again won handily by a score of 17 to 11. Four years later, Tony Jacklin was named captain of the European side and the Ryder Cup would never be the same. After suffering a heartbreaking loss at PGA National in 1983, Jacklin led the Europeans to victory in both 1985 and 1987. Over the next 20 years, the European side would win five times, compared to three wins for the Americans and one tie. A lopsided competition has evolved into a hotly contested rivalry. Now, people often ask me, Samuel, what's your favourite Ryder Cup memory? With 80 years of highlights to choose from, that's a very hard question to answer. I'll have to think about this. OK, I've thought about it. For me, the greatest moment in Ryder Cup history was a four-foot putt. It was 1969 at Royal Birkdale. The cup would be decided by the final match, and what a pairing it was. Jack Nicklaus, the best player in the world, against Tony Jacklin, the reigning Open champion. At the 18th green, the match was tied and both players were on in regulation. With his teammates watching anxiously, Tony Jacklin's birdie putt came to rest within two feet of the cup. Now it was Nicklaus's turn. This was the kind of moment Jack lived for. But not only did he miss this birdie attempt, he charged it four feet past. If he missed and Jacqueline made, the cup would reside in Britain for the first time in 12 long years. Jack took his familiar stance and willed his putt into the hole. As he picked up his ball, he also picked up Jacqueline's marker. With Jack's concession, the match ended in a 16-16 tie, and the US retained the cup. Long after the score has been forgotten, golfers will tell the story of Jack's remarkable gesture. So, at the end of the day, what is it that makes the Ryder Cup so special? Why will millions upon millions of sports fans throughout the world be holding their collective breath for the best three days in golf. I've come to the conclusion that human beings have a fundamental need to be part of something bigger than ourselves. At the Ryder Cup, victory earns a trophy, not a check. You're playing for history, for the honour of your country, your tour and your team. You're testing yourself under the most extreme pressure. And isn't that what a sportsman lives for? the chance to show what he's made of when it truly matters most. Winning matters, it matters a great deal. But this isn't a war, it's not life or death. Your great American champion, Arnold Palmer, said it best. It's like fighting with your brother. You can fight with him and fight with him. But at the same time, you get up and you love him more than anything else in the world. Beginning this Friday, 24 of the finest golfers in the world will give everything they have in pursuit of my golden trophy. For some, the dream of a lifetime will come true. And a lucky few will enjoy a moment like no other as they find reservoirs of heart and nerve that they didn't know they possessed. Perhaps the cup will remain here in America. Perhaps it will cross the pond once again. The one thing I can say with certainty is that the quality of play will be matched by sportsmanship and for that I am profoundly grateful and altogether humble. When you're 150, you need your rest. But before I go, 
It is with awe, wonder, and a great deal of pride that I say, ladies and gentlemen, please join me and stand up to welcome the teams of the 2008 Ryder Cup.